Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. If you take your seats, we'll begin in just a moment. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I'm Steve Morrison, uh, Vice President here at CSIS and Head of the Global Health Policy Center. Uh, and on behalf of Dr. Hamry and my colleagues here at CSIS, welcome to the second seminar on our U.S.-Swiss Dialogue series. I'd like to extend a warm welcome and a special thank you to Ambassador Urs Ziswiller, who will speak in a moment, uh, and his colleagues uh, at the Swiss Federal Department of Foreign Affairs, who generously provided the support for this program here today. I also want to thank, particularly thank my colleagues, uh, Heather Conley uh, and Jennifer Cook and Richard Downey, for putting this all together. Um, the, as we look back, I mean, this, I understand this program today is intended to really look back and look forward with the pivot being the CPA, uh, the Comprehensive Peace Accord. Um, just a few points of background that are relevant to, to today. We have brought together many of the key personalities who persevered throughout this period in putting the pieces together for that. And I think that's quite remarkable. Jennifer will introduce General Simbewo in a moment who presided over this process of negotiations, which was an arduous extended period of negotiations. It actually succeeded in a, the intense period of was about 30 months, which given the complexity, the length of the war and the complexity of the accord was actually quite a remarkable achievement. It probably didn't feel like it was quick to those who lived through it. Um, we uh, also have with us uh, a number of the other personalities who who were part of this. Susan Page is with us from the State Department um, today. Nick Hasem, they were together in Machacos and the other venues of these negotiations. Charlie Snyder, uh, um, Tim Carney, uh, many of the people who lived through this period and pushed it pushed it forward. Uh, and, um, and I think they deserve an enormous amount of credit and gratitude from us all uh, for the work that they put into this. Um, it's important to remember that this process sort of got kicked off just five days before 9-11 here in Washington when President, then President Bush appointed on the White House lawn Senator Danforth uh, as the envoy for the Sudan peace talks. Uh, it was a beautiful uh, fall day uh, and many of the people in this room were present when that happened. And Senator Danforth and Charlie Snyder and Bob Oakley and others began a process, a quite intense process that stretched into April, May of the following year of trying to test the parties to come back to President Bush and Colin Powell uh, and Condoleezza Rice with an answer to the question of whether the parties themselves were really truly prepared to, to to engage in a, in a process that had as its objective a negotiated settlement to the war. And one of the first tests, there were four tests that were pursued, but one of the first tests uh, was the Nuba Mountain ceasefire agreement, which was concluded in January of 2002. And that's where the Swiss came in. It was a U.S.-Swiss team that mediated that agreement, that ceasefire agreement within the Nuba Mountains, which remains a flashpoint in a particularly sensitive area within Sudan in the transition area to this day. That was concluded in Bergenstock. The party signed it into force, and we were very proud, those of us observing this process, that um, the U.S. was able to partner um, with the Swiss government in getting through that test. And that proved to be terribly important in building confidence looking forward. Because when the, when the administration, when the Bush administration then deliberated in the spring 
about whether to move forward, the answer was affirmative, that, it was, that this was an effort that deserved uh, a strong commitment. And I think if that decision had gone another way, we wouldn't be here today having this conversation. And so looking back, that Bergenstock agreement was very, very important. That period was one where we really moved to a focus on pragmatism and engagement. Um, it was a turning point away from the focus in the late 90s on condemnation and isolation and resort to war uh, or armed threats as a way of trying to resolve this. It was a period in which the Eritrea-Ethiopia war, which had huge consequences within the region, was still winding its way down. The DRC wars, multiple wars, were still very much with us. 9-11 became terribly important also in retrospect in boosting leverage and focus, particularly boosting the pressures upon Khartoum coming from Washington and elsewhere. And I don't think we can underestimate the degree to which that bump up contributed to creating momentum leading up to the 05 Accord. We'll hear a lot today about the details of what was, what was postponed in terms of decisions and preparations and the like and what was not postponed in the strategy of engagement, the strategy of enticing these parties and testing them and putting back upon the parties the, the ultimate responsibility of, 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 of making this a success. We've had a lot of experience the last five years, a lot of frustration among the parties. We've seen a remarkable durability and longevity of the government in Khartoum, even under the stresses of the ICC, uh, and the condemnations that have come over Darfur. We've seen the rising strategic asset of oil, the rising alliance with China, the spread of new actors, the UN effort, the AU effort. We'll hear more about that. And of course, now we're facing the prospect of great uncertainty and anxiety around what the future will look like and what the end game, or if there will be an end game, what it might look like. And we'll hear about the good, the bad, and the ugly, as one of my friends here this morning described the options that lie ahead as we move towards 2011. So those are just a couple of brief introductory framing remarks. Uh, I uh, congratulate all of you for this. And uh, again, thanks, very special thanks to the Swiss government. I'd like to introduce the ambassador to say a few opening remarks. And then Jennifer will introduce our keynote speaker, General Simbewa. Thank you all. Thank you, Stephen, for your kind words towards my government. Let me start by welcoming all of you here, and thank you for coming, and special thanks go to CIS as our partner. It's always wonderful to cooperate with you, and I hope that we have many other such events ahead of us. A thank goes also to my own team, uh, Guillaume and Simon, who are both in the room somewhere, there to the right, for having organized uh, this day. In our view, the coming months will be uh, critical in determining Sudan's future. So I'm more than happy to have a number of excellent experts here today to speak about Sudan. Some of the names were already mentioned. I will come back to it. Thank you, G General, that you found time to, to join us today and all other experts. I would like, not going into Sudan immediately, but say a few words about Switzerland and its mediation efforts around the world. It's probably one of the few countries who had in its constitution a sentence which says that the promotion of peace is the duty of the country. And therefore, it's one of our goals in foreign policy. And we believe that mediation is one of the most effective tools to achieve that goal. Therefore, my own ministry is directly or indirectly engaged in a quite impressive number of peace negotiation processes. Let me give you a few examples. 
we have mediated in a traditional classic form between Turkey and Armenia. Our state secretary traveled from capital to capital, brought people together, organizing meetings for both parties, making also proposals, presenting ideas, how we could come closer. And finally, the two parties met in Zurich and signed an agreement. Unfortunately, it's still not implemented, but that's also one of the problems you have in mediation. You have to be patient, and you have to have sometimes long periods of time ahead of you. Another example is Nepal, but that was another kind of mediation. A Swiss mediator worked absolutely behind the scenes, assisting local mediators, acting as go-between the Maoist movement and the political parties, arranging their first meeting in India and providing advice for the formulation of the peace agreement. And so far, so good. It still holds. It's certainly not what we, at the end of the day, expected. But again, we have to be patient. A third example is when Swiss experts on mediation supported the movements on, of Pap Papua with uh, capacity building workshops and on negotiations, mediation, designing of peace processes, and the topics of power and wealth sharing. And last but certainly not least, we are, since many, many years, very active in the Middle East. We had one of our seminars here on, on that subject, and maybe the, the most evident or most known effort of ours was the Geneva Initiative. And I was happily, myself, quite a bit involved in that. We had two goals with the Geneva Initiatives, very often wrongly understood and by politicians and by the medias. We had two goals. First, we wanted to prove that they are on both sides, still important people who really are ready to sit together and hammer out a peace agreement. And second, we wanted to create a document of reference which in any f future peace talks and negotiations will serve as a reference document. And if you look now at the direct talks going on, Almost every day, the Geneva Initiative is quoted. And I am personally convinced, if there will be a two-state solution in the Middle East, it will be plus minus 5%, 10% Geneva. These are a few examples of our more bilateral peace efforts and mediation efforts. But of course, we are also supporting the United Nations, often the main mediator in situations of violent conflicts. We support the Department of Political Affairs and its mediation support unit with funds and personnel. Then we recognize the need to support the expertise of regional organizations and this effort we are talking about today is a wonderful example for that. The Intergovernment Authority on Development is one of the organizations we are supporting, and we will certainly hear a lot of them uh, later on. Finally, Switzerland is supporting and closely cooperating also with the NGO world, specialized in the field of mediation. We are actively supporting the Center for Humanitarian Dialogue in Geneva, the mediation activities of Kofi Annan, but many, many other NGOs active in peace efforts and mediation are supported by us be it by personnel or with financial support. Mediation is highly relevant for Sudan. Sudan, as we all know, has had a challenging history since its independence. And Stephen already mentioned the ceasefire agreement at Bürgenstock, Switzerland, where I had the pleasure to be present with my minister at the time to sign uh, that agreement. And it was mentioned as probably the beginning of many other efforts and signing ceremonies. And we will hear today that we are still not yet at the end of our uh, efforts, pains, or whatever you name them, I'm sure there will be several words used for that. Sudan is, therefore, a very good example of my country's engagement in the field of mediation, especially in supporting the expertise of regional organizations. 
We have substantial commitments to Sudan. It is one of our focus country for our peace-building operations. At present, we are involved in various projects, including peace-building, promotion of human rights, humanitarian relief, security sector reform, and demining. And we are supportive of the UN agencies on site. But it's not up to me. We have excellent experts here, only, not only on the panels, which will follow, but also in the hall. And therefore, I would like to stop here and hand over to the keynote speakers. And I'm very happy to have General Subaibo here, who will be introduced uh, by somebody from the CSIS, <laughs> from Jeffrey. Please, thank you very much again for being here, and have a great morning. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Um, George Bernard Shaw wrote that peace is not only better than war, it's infinitely more arduous. Um, and it's a pleasure, therefore, and an honor today to introduce uh, General Lazarus Sumbewo, who, as I expect all of you know, um, played such a critical role in shepherding the parties to the Sudanese Comprehensive Peace Agreement, uh, the SPLA, and the government in Khartoum really to the first critical step in that arduous process. And I think we'll hear, uh, perhaps in the second panel, how that process goes on and will continue to go on, I think, over uh, several years, in fact, uh, ahead of us. Uh, General Simbewo served as the chief mediator of the Sudanese peace process under the auspices of EGAD, the Intergovernmental Authority on Development. Uh, at the request of President uh, Daniel Arap Moy, he left his post as Army Commander in Kenya in 2000 to take up this position of mediator in a conflict really that had racked Sudan essentially since independence uh, and that many, I think, in the broader international community in 2000 at least, thought of as, as hopelessly intractable. So I'm not sure, and perhaps General Sambeo can comment whether he considered this a promotion, uh, but he certainly rose to the challenge, um, and uh, as, as we all know today. Uh, General Sambeo came to the process uh, at a moment in which both North and South, I think, were, were exhausted from war. Uh, neither side really had any realistic prospect of an eventual outright victory, and I think there was increasing recognition of that. The international community, particularly the United States, as Steve mentioned, uh, was cautiously considering uh, a different tack on Sudan, moving towards more robust engagement with both sides uh, in partnership with a troika of partners, the UK, Norway, uh, really in support of an EGAD process. Uh, the, although the EGAD process really had been somewhat moribund throughout the 1990s, so there was a lot of skepticism around that. Uh, so in some ways it was a moment of opportunity, but I think a very fragile one given the level of mistrust between the two parties uh, and a history of failed agreements. So in, into that atmosphere, General Simbewo, uh really with uh, remarkable patience and a very principled approach, uh, was able to cajole, encourage, and inspire the two parties uh, to move from the declaration of principles that had lain on paper for, for a decade or, or, or six years or so uh, to the Machakos Protocol, uh, to the Memorandum of Understanding, and ultimately to the signing of the CPA in January 9, 2005. I think from the very get-go, he made very clear to the parties uh, that he was not a proxy for external interests. Uh, he was incredibly patient in listening to the concerns and aspirations of both sides. Uh, as a military man, I think he won the respect um, of, of, of the parties uh, in the conflict, but also the observers, and, and I think on a number of instances put them in their place as well. Uh, he was insistent to the Troika and the broader community that this was going to be a Sudanese process, and ultimately that the Sudanese uh, held the reins, were responsible for the outcomes, and that the timetable would be theirs. Uh, so he very, I think... Uh, pushed back really on the tendency for external mediators uh, to rush the process to a final signature and, and just get, get the thing done with. Uh, so uh, I won't keep this long. This is a person of remarkable patience uh, with a very strong sense of ethical purpose and mission uh, and energy. Um, just on a personal note, uh, 
during that period, uh, General Simbewo came to Washington for a couple of weeks, and I heard he did these early morning walks, and I thought how nice it would be to join this elder statesman for a nice stroll around the Washington monuments. Well, two hours and 10 miles later in 15 degree weather, I was completely exhausted and ready for a nap. <laughs> the general went on to a full day of, uh, of talks and, and affairs. Uh, and so I got some sense of the energy uh, uh, that, he, that he brings um, uh, to all his endeavors. Uh, he is officially now retired, but as he said last night, uh, he, he considers uh, retired to mean that he has new tires and he's ready to go. Most recently, he's been engaged uh, with uh, President Obasanjo in, in the Congo. And I'm sure um, we haven't heard the last of you on the international scene, General Simbebo. Welcome to CSIS. Uh, we're delighted to have you here. The general will speak and we'll open up for questions and then turn to a panel. Thanks. talking about me? <laughs> CIS directors and the staff, Swiss representatives, the United States of America representatives, participants, mem members of the media, my colleagues, who suffered with me for 30 months. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank God for enabling me to be here today. And so I'm pleased to be among us you to discuss this very important topic on the prospects for referendum in Sudan. It is indeed something that requires the attention of stock, uh, <coughs> stakeholders involved in the peace process and the implementation of the CPA. Today is exactly 92 days to go before the people of Southern Sudan exercise the right of self-determination in a referendum that forms part of the CPA. The road to the achievement of the CPA was bumpy, and the road to the referendum, or rather referenda, as there is the ABA referenda, the referendum is more challenging, has been more challenging. The implementation of the CBA itself, we may be aware that the CBA was not a perfect document, but it was the best under the circumstances that we operated in, taking into account the Sudan civil war had been running for several years, and the issues under dispute were of complex nature. I know many people have criticized the CBA. It is not comprehensive enough. It is not inclusive. It is not, um, we did not take into consideration many aspects that needed to have been taken into consideration. We agree, it's not perfect, but we st it managed to stop the war. And so at least we should get that credit that the war stopped. And it is, it is still, um, this, the war hasn't uh, erupted yet. The accord signed by both the North and the Southern Sudan, that is the, the then government of Sudan, which basically was represented by the National Congress Party and the SPLM representing the Southerners, <laughs> therefore provided the best way out of the 21-year war, although others hoped that it will also translate into democratization of the Sudan. This, however, uh, many would argue that it has not been achieved. I believe, uh, if I read it right, the, the international community at the time wanted to get in to the agreement phrases, clauses, sections that would eventually help the Sudan to democratize. Unfortunately, um, they have fallen by the wayside. 
they have not been uh, embraced, they have not been adapted, and so I believe this has to be, um, I'm, not, I'm not asking that we go to the table to redraw things, but I think it needs to be re-looked at. The region, and particularly IGAT subcommittee on Sudan, who facilitated the achievement of the CBA with the support of the international community for the first three years of the signing of the agreement, abandoned the process completely and abandoned the parties. What happened is that after signing the agreement, everybody said, hallelujah, hello Akbar, let's go. And everybody went and they went to, to, went to Darfur, forgetting that the, the parties had been fighting for over 21 years and they needed to be shepherded. It was with the assistance of the American government coming in at the right time when the then Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice had to come to Addis Ababa to implore the SPLM to resume their engagement with the National Congress Party in the Government of National Unity. There are a number of things that stand out as the main challenges in the implementation of the CBA. One, the border demarcation. And I want to explain a little bit about this border demarcation. In 1998, on the 7th of August, we made an agreement in Addis Ababa that the border was going to be the 1956 boundary at independence. I know this very well because it was the first, it was the day that the American embassy in Nairobi was bombed. And I was in Addis Ababa, I was signing this agreement saying we've agreed that the border was going to be. But you must understand that from the, from the National Congress Party, from the Northern uh, Party, that it is not easy to demarcate a border, to go and say we are demarcating a border. What message are you sending out? to the rest of the world and to the rest of the South and to the rest of your uh, constituency. You are saying, we are, this is the border, you can go. And that's not what it was meant. That was not what the CBA meant. The CBA encouraged unity. It says, we'll give a chance to unity, although nobody gives a chance to unity. So that's one of the things that, that's one of the challenges that has remained and continually to remain and it's not going to be easy because as soon as you start demarcating the border, you are sending a message to both sides, a different message. Second challenge is the preparation of the demarcation, uh, sorry, uh, uh, preparation for the referendum. Again, it's been slow. What message would you be sending as soon as you start putting in place that the referendum is going to take place. Referendum in Sudan doesn't mean the consultation of the people. It means something different. This is what I learned, and my colleagues will bear me out. In Ivasia, when you talk about referendum, you are talking about something else. Lack of political will. There's been a lack of political will, and especially from the National Congress Party. And you can understand why. The conflict areas of southern Kordofan, that's the Nuba Mountains, Blue Nile, and Abie. These areas have a problem. It's, they are at Catch-22. There are countries that are in there. There are areas that are in the north. They were fighting with the SPLM or SPLA. And so they, have, they are, in, they are in, 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 in a position where they... The challenge is, if, they, if the South secedes and goes, what happens to us who are in, in those areas? And that's the questions they are asking themselves. And so, this is, is a challenge. There's been a problem with wealth sharing. To this day, there is it's only from outsiders. It's not from the Sudanese themselves who are saying, 
this is the amount of oil we are getting from this well, and this is the amount of oil that is we are selling, and this is the oil that we are processing. There hasn't been, a, 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 what do you call it, um, an open um, explanation as to what, what, what's happening with the, what's happening with the, with the oil, or the oil revenue. And the southerners have not been able to account for the money that they have received. They have received the money, whether it goes into other people, in the people's pockets, whether this goes into what. I think the only thing that I have really seen come out very well in the south is tamaking of roads, a road or some roads in Juba. Lack of institutional capacity. If you tell SPLM you have no institutional capacity, they will not, they will not agree with you. But they have a problem. They have a problem. They do not. They have never run a system before. They have never run systems before. They ran war. They continue running war in, in, within. And so they, they are, they are lacking institutions, and they, they, they cannot. You know, we, they are talking about having a government of Southern Sudan. They are having state governments. They are having provinces. I, I think they are, they are in wards, but they are not. They are not. They are not there on the ground, and I. The people from the uh, NGO world will bear me out on this. I think the biggest challenge has been the Darfur conflict and the handling of it, of it by the government of Sudan and the international community. We, you, should, you should share, the international community should share the responsibility for really creating this challenge. Ladies and gentlemen, the prospects of the referendum. In discussing the prospects of referendum, it is vital that we look at the moments leading up to, its, up to it, especially in the last one year. The parties themselves have been pulling and pushing, one party accusing the other of sabotaging, while the other accuses one of rushing through without due care of the provisions within the CBA. The arrest warrant issued by the ICC against President al-Bashir, which still stands even after being re-elected, has created tension in the country. The tension has translated in developing defensive mechanisms by the North and, and the National Congress Party especially. Some African Union countries have also taken different positions regarding the ICC issue and even the referenda. The region, on the other hand, has had different perspectives of the final product of the referendum. They have therefore been sending conflicting signals to the parties. The witnesses to the CBA, and there are very many, have also not been pressurizing enough the parties to move forward in a direction that will produce positive and sustainable results. In the last one year, and more recently in various fora, the realization has come to all that the interim period is soon to come to an end. The IGAD, the African Union, the Arab League, the European Union, the Troika, and the United Nations seem to now pay more attention than in the previous years, following the signing of the CBA. IGAD called a summit early this year to look at the implementation of the CBA and to evaluate its progress. And they assure the parties that they will support them as they overcome their outstanding issues. I doubt. Recently, on 24th of last month, September, 2010, at the margins of the General Assembly of the United Nations, a Sudan high-level forum was held, and a strong communique was issued jointly by the parties and the Security Council, affirming that the referenda will take place on 9th January 2011 without fail and committed themselves to organize and support it. The initial challenge, challenges of setting up both South Sudan Referendum Commission 
and a BA referendum commission seem to have been overcome at that meeting. However, I think to date the BA referendum commission has not been established. A UN Security Council in Sudan this week will confirm that the Sudanese are either ready or not ready to cross this milestone. Ladies and gentlemen, preparations for the referenda. With only three months left before the referenda, the preparations needed to have been at an advanced stage. The people of the Sudan need to be sensitized on the importance of the referenda as well as the consequences of the outcome. It is important that the exercise is conducted peacefully and that the people are able to accept either of the outcomes. The referendum law is clear in accordance with the CBA, but the National Congress Party has been, seen, has been unwilling to put in place the mechanism to provide for a free and fair referendum. The registration of voters have not started. The commissions to oversee the referenda have yet to be established. Much is needed to be done in order to achieve acceptable results of a free and fair referenda. There is also need to commence a training of the officials who will oversee the process. To this end, financial and technical support from the international community will be of significant assistance. Sending impartial missions of observers during the process will also be vital because they will reduce the chances of an unfair process for all the parties involved. Post-referenda period. The outcome of the referenda will greatly change the future of Sudan and also have an impact on the region. The expectations from the Sudan, however, will be, maintain, will be to maintain peace before and after the referenda. The outcome of the referenda, unity or cessation, need to be discussed by the parties before the outcome is known so that the parties can properly negotiate options of their relationships in critical areas of civilized integration, which is, if it is unity, or separation in the event of the outcome of secession. Citizenship after the referenda in case of secession. Economic cooperation, both rely heavily, and especially the southerners rely heavily on the oil revenues in order for them to run institutions. Border issues, including transit communities for pastures and water. These were discussed very, very at length, and it, it took us quite a number of sessions to discuss the traversing of the um, nomadic tribes, which have been doing it for over four, four or four or so, four hundred years or so, crisscrossing in summer and winter, uh, the borders for water and pasture. And this needs to be put in place. There are people, civil servants, who are serving in the Sudan. What happens? Where are they going? To, what is going to happen to them? There are politicians, both in north and in the south, of different colors and shades. They need to discuss about that. The paramount reason as to why there needs to be discussions on these items is because there is risk. There is a risk that they, they could be the same factors that could be the cause of conflict should the outcome not favor one of the parties. The region has a stake in the outcome of the referenda, especially the North-South referenda. IGAD subcommittee chairman has promised to call for a meeting in November 2011 to harmonize the regional position during and after the referenda. Needless to say that the hope for the region 
members is peace and prosperity for the Sudan and the region at large. Ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, you will agree with me that the achievement of the CPA was a monumental task and it is the implementation was even more complex and difficult, having several challenges, some of which have not completely been overcome. The excitement of the Southerners is at its highest point to achieve what they have not achieved in, 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 over, 60 years, in over 60 years. Care must be taken in the preparation and the actual referenda in order to avoid return to conflict. The conflict areas remain equally a source of concern for both the North and South Sudan, especially if the Southerners vote for secession. Serious preparations for post-referendum period should be undertaken now by the parties with the assistance of all the witnesses and the people of goodwill to avoid protracted negotiations that will lead to further tension. The rhetoric coming out of both Khartoum and Juba should be avoided for the sake of peace in Sudan and the region. Ladies and gentlemen, many of us here were involved in the process towards the CPA, and we must therefore, where possible, see to it that its implementation to the letter, because in actual fact, we are guarantors of the agreement and know the insights that lead to, led to its signing. We therefore owe it to the people of Sudan. Thank you. General Sobewo, uh, thanks so much for really uh, laying out the past, but also uh, laying out very clearly the challenges of the future. And I think we get a sense from you, from your talk, really, of, of what made you such a, an excellent mediator in this, um, in terms of challenging both parties and the international community, um, and, and, and calling things uh, as you see them, which are um, uh, very valuable. Um, let's open up for, we'll take a few questions at a time for the general. We'll, we'll do about seven minutes, I think, um, to, to get on with the next uh, uh, panel. But uh, we'll start then um, with Ni Akwete. Um, Ni, the microphone's coming. Please identify yourself. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Ni Akwete. I work with a group here called um, ADNA, um, <clears throat> and we focus on African issues. General, you mentioned um, the question of uh, some of the, what EGAD states, how they look at the Sudanese situation, as well as some of the other countries outside of EGAD. So my question is, given that the African countries have different views of what should happen, I have heard from other places that some say, look, we don't support this because we all have our southern Sudans. And if this happens, what's going to happen with parts of our countries want to secede? Given your very special work and role, looking at both sides, where, what advice do you have for the continent in general? Do we support what is in effect a peaceful divorce from a bad marriage? Or do we say that this will set a very bad precedent of secession in other countries. So where should African countries, uh, what, what kind of position should they take? What, do, what is your advice? Thank you. with our humanity in the balance? Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, I'm curious if you could speak to Meryl Zendarski. Mm -hmm. Yes, with our humanity in the balance. 
Um, I'm wondering if you could speak to, in your opinion, if the referendum has a destabilizing effect in Sudan, how you think that might affect regional issues, specifically with the LRA and with the ongoing conflict in the Congo. My name is Erwa. I'm a journalist and a daily columnist in Sudan. Taking into consideration that we cannot or should not dishonor the CPA, which is stop the war. But I read last, uh, yesterday, a, 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 a pessimistic uh, article, Mr. Nicholas, you remember him? Nicholas Christopher, very pessimistic article. Taking into consideration this, don't you think that by making the same mistake as during the Nimero regime, the Addis Ababa Accord, 1972-1982. They're the one-man show, Mr. Nimeri. And then now it's the one-party show, this NCP. Could we, could we make a, a comprehensive peace solution for the whole Sudan? Because if it not accommodate, then therefore, Committed other parties in this CPA, maybe you commit the same mistake as 1982, the collapse of P uh, this Ababa Accord. How, what, how do you think? Thank you. From the Royal Military College of Canada. Sir, I would like to ask you what do the North and the South agree on? if, in fact, the mandate to separate happened. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, there, isn't, there isn't a major deviation between uh, the countries of IGAD and the countries, uh, the, the other countries of Af uh, Africa. I think they are about 50-50 each. They have views uh, of difference of what would the referenda, if in the event that the southerners secede, what would it, what would it cause in, in the region and beyond. I think it, if the two parties agreed the way the Ethiopians and Eritreans agreed to divorce and yet went back to war. It is not, you cannot give up a marriage if the marriage is not uh, performing. You cannot give it by force. You cannot continually, if, if the parties decide that this marriage we have to go to court or we have to uh, call the elders to dissolve it, then dissolve it. You, you can't you can continue, continually make people uh, stick together even when they don't want to stick together. Just because you want to uh, maintain boundaries that were drawn in Berlin in 1895. It's going to affect very many countries in Africa. It's not it's not, um, it's not, it's not only Sudan. Congo is in the line. Um, possibly Kenya and Tanzania are on, also, also on the line. Other countries are in the line. But it is it's because you have to recognize that you cannot mix water and oil and call it just liquid. Because they are different. Each one has different properties. So let's, 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 let's do it Let's do it harmoniously. And it is better if the parties are involved themselves rather than trying to impose from externally, saying, no, we have to do this because um, if we do it, others will be affected. And so, you know, I mean, why, why didn't we ask questions when Yugoslavia broke down into various countries? They were accepted. Some of them are already in, in the European Union. 
I think I think we 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 if and and this was this if people, in fact the African ones did not come by agreement. They they were imposed upon. Communities were cut into various groups. So, I think that's 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 my take. Meryl, speak to, in opinion, the, referen uh, the referendum is a destabilizing effect. I don't think so. If it was properly organized, uh, properly, uh, because it is something that was accepted, that uh, the Southern Sudanese will exercise their right of self-determination through a referendum, uh, why should it be a destabilizing factor? It shouldn't be. It should, if it is properly organized. If it is, if it is disorganized, then it becomes a, a problem. So the parties must understand that it is, it is good to organize. Um, I'll give you an example. We had very we had symbolic elections in, in 2007 in Kenya, and it, it, it costed the lives of over 1,000 1, people. We had a referendum recently, well organized, not a single life was lost. And it was more contentious, contentious or content, contentious than the, 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 the elections. Um, how do we go so that uh, this is Arua? How can we go so that the, 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 the CPA cannot be dishonored? You know, this, this thing has been lingering in my mind all, all along after Nimeri uh, through the uh, December agreement through the window into the, into the Nile and said it is not either. It is neither the Koran nor, nor the Bible. There is, there is a big difference this time, a big difference. Uh, let me, um, I think this agreement was well thought of. There were implementation modalities in it. The, there is an army, there are two armies in the country today, in Sudan, and they are not, they are not very, it's not going to be a very easy uh, throw away. You, you cannot just throw it away without having to pay a price. Uh, people are going to pay a price. And the people who are going to pay a price are Sudanese. And so they better not throw it away. Whether it is in the south or in the north, blood is going to be, to be shed if this thing is thrown away. And I think they'd better not do it. Lastly, what do the parties agree on? On everything except implementation. <laughs> when it comes to implementation, it gets difficult. But they agreed nearly on everything, how, to, how things should be done. They agreed to live peacefully. They agreed to share resources. They agreed that two militaries exist. They agree on a number of principles that they have. But when it comes to moving one, one, one leg forward, it becomes very difficult. For either party. You ask them to move towards unity, each one moves away. You ask them to move towards cessation, each one moves away. Thank you. General, <laughs> we are going to take a seat in the front row, and I think I hope during the course of the discussion, if, um, if something is directed at you from the panelists or you want to pipe up, we can still call on you. We're going to wrap this session up and move to the next panel now. Thank you so much. I'm available. <laughs> okay, wonderful. <laughs> Thank you.